we have about 80 people, 80 percent of the people who have already responded. Um, if you haven't yet, please just fill it out. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Andres. Uh, this is a really amazingly balanced um, uh, distribution, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. So 85%, we can maybe just uh, cut it off to so close to 90%. So we can end the poll perhaps here. Uh, and uh, so you could share, see the results. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we have about 60% of folks. Uh, uh, this is not exclusive, so folks can be in several fields at the same time. Uh, so about 60% of the folks uh, are in some way involved with um, or interested in urban planning, 50%, 55% urban design, third architecture, um, uh, about the same in mobility, and 44% spatial analytics. Um, mm -hmm. Very briefly, I would also like to uh, share a second poll because the talk today does um, talk about professional experience and the briefs that urban designers face. So this is a very simple poll that asks you whether you've ever participated in, in some professional capacity in an urban design or planning project, e.g. as a consultant, planner, designer, or other paid role in the process. So how many folks here have professional experience in the real world? Just another 20 seconds or so. We have about 82% responded. We're seemingly fairly stable at that. Um, another 10 seconds. And OK, so I'll go ahead and uh, finish the poll there. I think we are uh, converging towards an equilibrium here. Um, and so we have a roughly uh, 2 thirds of the audience who have uh, real world professional um, experience and about a third or a little bit more uh, who are probably students or um, uh, young academics who have not yet been in professional roles um, in planning and design. Um, so with that, um, provides a little bit of a um, perspective on, on who we have in the room. Um, I also would like to encourage everyone to type into the chat uh, any questions that you have during the talk. We try to encourage everyone to the extent possible, please keep your cameras on and your audios off so that we have a more interactive session and our speaker today can also see uh, who is in the room. And so it's not a one-way talk. Um, and second, um, uh, we'd like to also encourage you to type in the audience or in the Q&A right now, uh, what city and country you are connecting from uh, so that we get a sense of where the audience is connecting from around the world. So I'll just uh, put this out there and we'll share the chat session with our speakers. So uh, it'll be great for them to see uh, who have connected to these talks. Um, without further ado, um, Professor Ying Jin is a professor of architecture and urbanism at Cambridge University in the UK, where he also served as the director of the Martin Center for Architectural and Urban Studies, of which we actually heard about a little bit during the last talk uh, last Monday. In the Architecture and Urbanism Department at Cambridge, he leads the Cities and Transportation Research Group, as well as city scale data science and urban modeling applications at the EPSRC, Center for Smart Infrastructure and Construction. Professor Ying's main research Professor Jin's main research interests are compu uh, computer models of cities and urban history. He has extensive industry experience and has directed multidisciplinary teams in building and using computer models as experimental platforms to appraise policy scenarios that involve investment, regulation, pricing, and promotional campaigns. And I believe we'll see some of these um, model results as they influence policy um, in the talk today as well. Without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Jin. I'll just stop sharing my screen and you can take over the screen from your side. Uh, thank you so much, um, Andres. Um, I'm just um, trying to share the screen. Um, share, share. So hopefully this is shared. Um, I'll put it in the presentation mode. Yeah, so that's all okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Andres, you can see it, right? No. Yes. The title page. Yeah. So here, and uh, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to um, 
come and talk to you and I hope that uh, we'll make this uh, a much more uh, interactive session it would be great. Now, here uh, I wanted to talk uh, to you as uh, people generally working in the built environment with an uh, amazing balanced um, profile of uh, people from uh, the, the main components. Uh, why um, you yourselves may have felt so constrained by uh, your project brief and uh, how can that be done? to deliberate us from these. And uh, I'll give uh, an example in the UK and the why UK and uh, this will come in a minute, right? The life of an uh, urban designer and urban planner and the people, a spatial uh, analyst has all got harder. And, uh, and here is uh, a caption from the recently published report uh, from UN um, DP, because this is a human uh, film report, 2021-22, and it shows that um, the, um, the the global human development index um, has just actually deviated from the projected trend since 1990. It's all the way up. Um, at an amazingly constant rate. And why is that important? Because uh, as uh, the situation in the cities gets um, more difficult and uh, there will be fewer resources, and then, then um, there will actually will be more core for yourselves actually to make an effort. Now, here we're talking about why the uh, urban designers face increasingly more constrained project briefs. And uh, I'll give you a few examples. Um, those designing public space uh, usually have a very little say over uh, current and future transport options. And uh, I think uh, Professor Yang Gao is going to talk to you. Um, and uh, he's, for example, had done a huge number of projects. Uh, one of the projects in point here um, uh, is the, um, I think, uh, a Times Square um, that uh, he was a consultant. And uh, he uh, uh, faced lots of different constraints, but intelligently, he was able to paint the existing hammock surface of some of the places actually, which made the mark and uh, actually changed people how I think about it. But uh, the wider Times Square and the, all those uh, uh, streets in Manhattan, uh, still very stubbornly and uh, being fought over by different people of different requirements. Right? And those designing offices uh, uh, know a few of the um, young workers that can really afford to near, uh, live nearby if they are really designing great and gleaming offices. But uh, um, when they look at their brief, and they cannot really include any space uh, um, about housing actually to accommodate uh, the young workers uh, who are actually in the city is generally getting a very bad deal at the moment. And those designing housing and neighborhoods will have very little say on jobs and travel options. And um, they're told to design neighborhoods and uh, uh, they design it pretending that there's that going to be very good jobs nearby and very good travel options. and more than half of the, uh, the, uh, the cases, actually, this will not be true. And therefore, there are lots of these places which are left idle and unpopular uh, and decayed, actually, appropriate or unbought. The overall result is that the design projects fall far, far, far short of their potential. And uh, there are urban designers who would prefer to focus on what they are best at. But most people, I would believe, including people here, would wish to have a more of a say of the how city uh, is designed and the, that covers the whole of the city. Yeah, so one of the important reasons is that uh, the world around us are streaming into, and this is a very sad, I'm not condoning this fact, but that this is uh, uh, very much the case, into either super prime areas or subprime areas. The super prime are where the best jobs are, and everyone wants to live there, 
that is finding affordable, congested, overcrowded, and uh, every inch of land is fought over, just like what I said about Manhattan Island. But this is not just that, but actually many places, many places around you, actually, in the other Cambridge. And this also happens in every city and city region um, in the US, Japan, Germany, China, and you name it, right? And uh, super and subprime areas have uh, many opposites, but they both actually act to restrict uh, urban design options. And for the super prime areas, people generally are very resistant to development. So this could be, could be called NIMBY or variously uh, different things, or just uh, the cost of development will be so high, right? And uh, and uh, the subprime areas uh, are the reverse. People um, actually don't have any interest. They cannot raise money. And the subprime is initially a credit idea that they really cannot really get any credit and therefore uh, financial credit, and therefore they cannot really do anything about it. Why is UK an interesting example? And here uh, I show uh, this uh, data from a, a, a Dutch organization which uh, actually has done painstaking efforts to look at uh, the per person productivity, that's the output per person over a period since, two, uh, since 1900. And the UK is this uh, uh, thick black line, which started in 1900, uh, second, right, among these rich countries, which has got a list on the right. Then um, just below, well, actually quite a distance below Switzerland, but um, actually ahead of the pack for everybody else. And the look at actually where it ended um, in 2014 when. Uh, this data series actually stretched. Uh, it may have been updated now, so uh, I should have another look. But uh, um, one of the main reasons uh, we have found in our research uh, is to do with the losses over many decades of productive regions outside London and the Southeast. And uh, for those who don't know uh, Britain that much, because uh, there is an arrow sort of pointing where London is. And uh, well, that region around uh, London has got quite a lot of deprivation inside because um, in urban areas, you always get uh, quite a lot of that. Uh, but uh, London is a very rich region and uh, all around it, the green and blue areas are the best uh, and more uh, most affluent areas, as you can see. So this is generally called London in the Southeast. Um, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, I think uh, I'll show it here. And all the rest, for example, uh, Midlands, uh, Birmingham is here, and the Manchester, Liverpool, these are historically uh, hugely productive cities, and the Yorkshire, uh, sort of the Leeds, uh, the Penang corridors, Newcastle upon Tyne, Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow, Belfast, and all these places used to be uh, really very productive, and you read them in history books, and then look at the the index of uh, income and job um, deprivation. So they have lost good jobs and they have declined in income and uh, they've been running for decades. So it's been losing the talented people as well. Right? Now, why the, uh, another reason is that we study the UK because uh, we could uh, treat this as a, one of the largest um, mega city regions. Uh, in the world, it has a total population of 67 million uh, last year. And uh, one factor which actually could come to an advantage of this area is that it has a maximum distance between the main cities from London to Aberdeen. And uh, you actually, if you follow the, the Queen and the uh, uh, recent death, because um, these two cities actually see much of the air traffic in the news is under 640 kilometers, which is basically an hour's journey by a plane. And uh, this will come to be useful. And uh, in Japan, you cannot really cover this distance, um, uh, which is why the, 
you'll be harder to do it as one city region. Now, my, my main message to you uh, in this talk is that if you don't like to be constrained with your project briefs, uh, either for urban plans, urban design, transport, whatever, you need to reach out to others working on the wider urban systems. What are they? Those are to do with different industries, the production, uh, productive sector and the economy, that is at the households, um, actually how they behave themselves. There's a transport market, and there's a estate market for both the business floor space and housing. There's also the land, which is under the buildings. And all of that, um, what we have done is to group them together uh, through a structural way uh, of uh, um, um, causal relationships inputs and outputs uh, they provide each other with. And we think that uh, it's better for us, actually, uh, urban designers, architects, planners, and the people who are directly working on this, to have a direct handle uh, over the development of analytic tools that can help uh, to coordinate the development of the economy, jobs, housing, transport, resource flows, emissions, including carbon emissions, and the environmental conservation generally. The simulation model we use, and this is a, a diagram of this, and this has got the papers that people can read, uh, is called uh, the LUISA Recursive uh, Spatial Equilibrium Model. And we use this uh, as a, a computer-based tool with a vast amount of data, and uh, also we model um, many uh, cross sections. In the UK, we tend to use uh, the census years like 1981, 91, um, 2001, 2011, and 2021, and so on as uh, the, the main cross sections. But uh, we also add others strategically to cover the data imperfections. For example, 2021 isn't a quite a, a good one. So that's a way that the we we'll go back to 2019, 2020 data. And here I'll give you an example of the model application, which is called the UK 2070 Futures, which is a project that we developed for the UK 2070 Commission. And uh, as the government is in uh, utter chaos, and actually has been utter chaos, we've been working with uh, a civic group called the UK 2070 Commission, which includes um, um, lots of the uh, academics, uh, lots of the professional uh, uh, people who are working in, in projects, and we're also including um, a large group of metro mayors uh, who actually um, collaborate uh, with this work. So this is the kind of uh, policy and the civic group engagement we have. I'll first talk about the assumptions, then some findings, and then we can actually also discuss the, uh, more. So um, when you do a modeling of this type, then one first thing to note is that uh, you need a huge amount of patience. Not only the patience to deal with the, the data, which will be inconsistent between the census years, for example, but also uh, you need to uh, be aware that uh, the, any changes in the built environment uh, is measured by decades, not by years or months, generally. And here, when we look into the future, we look at uh, the growth scenarios over a, a 60 year period, as you can see from 2011. And here is uh, was the, the trajectory of uh, GDP growth, right? So, um, uh, and then we had the, the COVID drop. And then what we did was a trumpet shaped uh, area to say um, the UK could act like Japan, which is uh, this low rate of growth, right? And uh, the low growth is like annualized 0.6% uh, a year. There's also a high growth 
um, of a 2.35% a year. We thought that uh, this was high enough. The government uh, currently announced that they wanted uh, 2.5% of growth every year. So this curve will just go to um, a stratosphere very easily, right? But post COVID, we think that uh, it will not be sensible to uh, expect the economy to grow very fast. So in the well, next few years, the growth is likely to be anemic and therefore is more like the uh, low growth scenario. But compound uh, growth is a, a magical thing. And uh, as you have a persistently making an effort, this could actually uh, go faster. Uh, and uh, the UK actually has got the examples of that in the past period. The second assumption is about the population and number of workers. Right. And uh, in fact, that this is a two part assumption. First is how many people there are. And the second is how many workers um, uh, or how much uh, each worker could produce. Now, one thing which has been very clear, although not everyone knows, is that uh, the uh, population of the world uh, have been stabilizing, not because that the people thought that uh, um, climate change is going to have a huge impact, but it is to do with uh, the long term um, urbanization trend, which actually uh, has acted as a very good uh, contraceptive um, for all the urban parts of the population. The UN population uh, projections actually show that uh, the population is likely to, uh, to be stabilizing uh, as the main trend. In terms of the growth um, of the workers, um, we thought that the UK should not really um, expect that a lot more people will be uh, emerging, either from natural growth or from migration in this country. So the, the growth rates actually are likely to be quite low, even in the high growth scenario, right? Because when you have a high population growth, you will attract more people. In terms of the productivity trends, you can see the interesting uh, dilemma we have, because since 2006 onwards, this is basically when the financial crisis started to take any effect, um, the UK actually has not had any productivity growth uh, at all uh, at this point. So um, then, um, so what we have assumed is that in the low growth scenario, is likely to be low in the high growth because then if you want to have a, a high economic growth and there's not so many people to go around then you have to increase the productivity growth and how do you uh, really uh, encourage people to be productive and this is something that the urban planner and designer can make a contribution on as i come to in a minute so here is a summary that you can look at uh, in your leisure. Basically, what we also look at would be these scenarios about uh, dwellings. Um, and uh, we have two scenarios. One is to say um, it's a high growth and a low growth scenario, but they're both actually looking at uh, where uh, the uh, more housing could be built. And this is actually the observation in the last uh, few years. And actually, the, uh, the darker areas is actually where the housing is even built. Why London has not got a huge amount of building in housing? That is very simple because um, once you have a, a super prime area, then people are resistant. And the, uh, this is uh, one of the amazing regularities uh, planners and designers trying to rail against the shouldn't. And basically for us, what we look at would be uh, assumptions of a low population growth scenarios uh, and the high population growth scenarios. The rates differ, but the areas that can have this kind of growth uh, is more likely to follow what uh, um, we have observed in the last few decades rather than uh, what um, the government wants, which is really build a lot of housing in London and in the most popular places in the Southeast. 
And this kind of intersections of um, um, overall economic growth and population growth and the geographic uh, spread uh, basically gives you uh, four scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is really to say you have um, relatively high growth of um, the economy, but the business as usual, therefore uh, the imbalanced pattern of growth, the, the very strong London Southeast versus the weak everywhere else will continue. And then in B, which is basically low growth and business as usual, everyone actually um, better off. Uh, of course, if you look at uh, a different spread of uh, uh, attracting jobs and the housing to the currently low growth areas, then you have a convergent economy and therefore in the low growth will be a slow leveling up. So this is likely to be quite anemic or in a high growth scenario, which is what we want, you have a, a dynamic recovery. So this is basically uh, what we're saying. But for the first three scenario, A, B, and C, we assume that uh, the door-to-door -door travel time uh, will be more or less uh, as before, because uh, there's not a huge amount of a policy initiative to, to do a lot more projects, actually. Uh, even if there are government plans, actually, uh, the likelihood that they're delivered uh, is very low. And for scenario D, we assume that uh, uh, there's uh, the critical business travel times between all major cities will be reduced to one hour and 45 minutes door to door by 2070 uh, through a combination of the technology and good planning. And then within each region, the critical travel times are also reduced by 10% in the next 10 years because uh, uh, to do more um, for inter-regional uh, travel, you need more time to do. And uh, this is the current uh, situation of uh, travel between London and the rest is hugely concentric. And to all of these places, Newcastle, if you really want to go very quickly, you probably have to fly in and fly out. Right? And here is uh, where you show the distances, um, basically all these regions. Uh, so this actually shows the, uh, well, most of northern regions are about four hours to to, door to London. And this is, uh, and um, for Manchester, almost every region is uh, beyond two hours. And that's no use because uh, if you are two hours uh, and more, then you're unlikely to be able to travel conveniently to have uh, day to day business meetings. And what we want is that this is the look to so every region, to so every city, including the northern cities, should be within about two hours. Jen. And this used our uh, Louisa model. It uh, uh, had a, a large modeling team to correct the biased um, spatial observations, which is the data, and the calibrate spatial equilibrium parameters, which would take a lot of effort, and then incorporate the observed brands and the congestion times and so on. And uh, we then will be able to reproduce the patterns of uh, deprivation. Uh, transport, job access, and housing as a validation, and so on. And the findings from the model. So, if you have a, a business as usual, um, um, but the higher growth, the London, the Southeast, the wider Southeast, you call it here, actually, we just leave everybody else. So, all of the UK. Basically, you have a situation, as I said, of the super prime and the subprime, and then both actually will be going against um, the urban designers. And if the, the growth scenario is poor, then all of the regions will be like um, uh, uh, here, right? So everybody will suffer. Only when the, the growth is redistributed and um, at a reasonable high level and with a gradual tendency of a change, then you can have a, a scenario where you will find that uh, there are possibilities to coordinate jobs, housing, transport, energy production, and so on, and then to have a more sustainable future. 
and the he, here are some maps to show that um, if it, at a low growth, the London and South Seas will be roughly okay, and the rest will be enter into recession territory. And while in the opposite, in the more uh, ideal situation for us, then because the more economic activities have been redistributed uh, to the rest of the UK, both the UK, uh, the London and South East actually have lessened pressure and also increased uh, wealth uh, in the rest of the UK. And the, one of the key factors in here is to do with the density of the high skilled workers. And this is the situation in 2011 census. And this is the condition we want to do. Basically, we want to recover and um, develop new uh, productive centers in the rest of the UK in order actually to, to drive the economic recovery. And this is to do with the, the proportion of skilled jobs in the same picture. And here, basically, what we look at is basically a gradual lessening of the um, income and the job deprivation through time and then you need to have a 50-year period uh, in order to achieve um, a leveling up really uh, of the conditions and here are the uh, final words um, which are to do um, with uh, the UK special circumstances particularly the good distances between the cities uh, that could actually be covered within one hour and 45 minutes. And um, then job housing balance is achieved more easily with a job led plan rather than a housing led plan. And the government has always placed more emphasis on housing, which is uh, the wrong thing to do. And um, centers new jobs are unlikely to emerge if they're more than an hour and 40 minutes away door to door from existing centers like London and the Southeast, because uh, the business and social critical trips uh, are not conveniently. Uh, Interregional and the intra-regional transport have a powerful steer on productivity. So I really encourage you to look at the uh, transport. And the uh, final uh, thing is about uh, the equilibria balances. These are all temporary. And they're easily lost and very uh, difficult to regain. And therefore, we need to really put a huge amount of effort into that. And finally, here are the, um, the, the production of the UK 1070 Commission documents, which actually had quite an influence uh, on the government thinking in the more tranquil times. And uh, I could talk more about it. And here is a list of the people who have been involved in this. And there are some references, I think, for people to look at um, uh, if they're interested. And I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Andreas. Great. Thank you uh, for sharing this um, this work. Um, and I, I indeed appreciate the um, attempt to engage an urban design audience in a broader uh, regional conversation about uh, economic growth and and how the city system of cities in the example of UK uh, may be evolving. Uh, um, as a phenomenon that we can actually model with these uh, land use transportation interaction models um, over time. Um, I want to start out perhaps uh, with a question uh, and, and acknowledging that a lot of this would be based on what scenario you assume, uh, since yes. you have uh, rather, there are, there are different, different scenarios, uh, uh, sort of a business as usual versus pretty uh, rapid investments uh, into transit infrastructure that could capitalize on new growth, et cetera. But um, yeah. giving, keeping this in mind, what can your 2071 model or 2070 model for the UK uh, tell urban designers and planners about where city growth uh, may be headed to? What sorts of projects do you think uh, become the bread and butter uh, for urban design uh, as they will, they differ from what people are working on today. So, or or will will your scenarios and the model outputs assume that um, 
uh, the regional economic balancing that occurs in, in smaller towns, et cetera, with the, with the workforce moving out of London and, and uh, increasingly into other cities uh, will still, uh, from an urban design perspective, uh, mean uh, a, a sort of similar typologies of work, similar typologies of projects and plans that people may be commissioned to do. So what do you think this means for urban design as a field? Where do you think uh, regional growth in the UK could be uh, pinpointing urban design. And I want to qualify that question with also this sort of uh, mind experiment of if we were talking about this um, 50 years ago, uh, back yeah. in 1970, the kind of stuff that got built uh, in the 1970s on both sides of the pond and, and, and all the way through the 80s was really different from what we actually ended up building uh, now, yeah. I think, uh, because yeah. the inner city revival uh, and the turning away from the sort of highway oriented suburban growth was was really a, a veritable shift that nobody perhaps anticipated to the extent that it occurred. So what do you think this means for urban design? Well, uh, if I can separate that into two questions, um, the first question is to do with uh, where do you think the uh, urban development is headed, right? Um, without major intervention, um, with uh, the rather anemic uh, population growth, the current pattern will persist forever. So um, the only way you, you can change it will be you need to um, inspire a huge number of people who will then invest in the places currently are deemed to be uh, not investable. Uh, and then uh, that will pull up uh, housing and therefore uh, build new communities uh, in, in those areas. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, the amount that an uh, urban designer uh, will be able to achieve will only be sort of knocking uh, around the margins and uh, will be, uh, it will be a small contribution, but uh, nothing significant. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the first thing uh, to, to say. Secondly, uh, I think you also asked a question uh, about uh, what uh, urban designers should do. Uh, they should um, uh, really wise up and uh, look at um, anything to do with money, right? I have here a very good quote, and uh, uh, if I challenged our quotes of uh, Jacques-Jean Rousseau, uh, uh, who actually talked about um, money uh, will actually give you uh, the freedom and uh, uh, the lack of money and difficult to attain it will give you um, slavery basically but uh, certainly for um, urban designers work closely with people who uh, know how to invest and the, the conditions to investment particularly to invest in enterprises and transport and without that uh, uh, nothing else really happens big. Mm -hmm. So just to build on that um, uh, argument, and I think you made a strong argument in your model presentation too, that uh, regional investments into better intercity connectivity are absolutely central to dispersing uh, the wealth uh, from the superstar cities outward to, yeah. to other places. Um, Usually, urban designers are called into the urban development process um, when the higher level strategic decisions about development has already been made by either politicians or people who have the capital uh, and control to yeah. some extent. Um, but you're making an argument that urban designers ought to be uh, engaging earlier in the process and through these different disciplines, including transportation. Can you talk us through a little bit what your vision for that is, how would people from urban design backgrounds do that? Uh, who would they be, uh, should they be collaborating with? And, and how um, would such work get started? Generally, urban designers will respond to RFPs that come out from uh, whether private or public uh, sources, and, and they will kind of have a program or, or a brief to kind of follow. But what you're suggesting is quite different, is not to sort of wait for, for that, but rather strategically uh, engage in, in proactive ways. And maybe you can describe absolutely. a little bit what you mean by that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Now, um, if you engage 
uh, early, not only um, you get the good lunches and the, with people, um, but also you um, actually know where the investment intentions are. Therefore, uh, for your commercial work, you get actually more projects. Uh, I'll give you one example, which is a uh, enormous but uh, also partial success of um, Lord Richard Rogers, who actually in 1998 um, uh, had a group of people around him actually wrote this report of urban renaissance and uh, made a very clear case that uh, um, a Britain was a very small island. We need to actually use land very economically. Right. So this actually was accepted. There has been a huge impact on actually where housing actually has been developed uh, in the in the UK uh, since then. And uh, very successful in that regard. What I hope that uh, he uh, would have also uh, have done, and that this is the work that we should uh, now continue, is to look at um, the case of uh, developing uh, different um, productive centers in the UK in order to rebalance the population. We have only the final time window. And uh, in my view, uh, the population in the UK will become um, static, absolute static, with a growth rate of zero or so by 2050. And once that happens, uh, it will be absolutely impossible uh, to engender big change. And uh, so the existing build pattern will persist. Uh, so, I suspect for centuries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And th this will also uh, apply to places like um, uh, many parts of the United States. And I, yeah. I think I have also have a, a colleague thank you from other countries actually here. I think uh, across the developed world, what well, that'll be the case. Yes, in, indeed. I think in the US, uh, the conversation very much uh, similar worries about the economic growth have have uh, been perhaps somewhat tempered by the fact that US has remained still a big destination for immigrants and yeah. uh, human the growth in human numbers uh, has has perhaps tempered uh, the the slowdown of uh, economic productivity with some extent whereas Britain's choices have been somewhat different in the last um, uh, few years with brexit etc uh, I, I want to uh, open this up and engage uh, questions or comments from from the room. Uh, I think the chat's been relatively quiet, um, but um, let's open it up and see whether um, we have thoughts, uh, questions uh, that anybody would like to um, chime in on. You may wanna just raise your hand if you do, or or also start with, uh, uh, so Maybe Ariana. I can, I can kick us off uh, with a question while more people get excited and, and put them there is in the, in the chat. Uh, so thank you, for Professor Ying, for the presentation. Um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more about the loss of productive regions in the peripheries, right, which is what you documented uh, in yeah. your presentation. I'm, I'm just wondering if you can also comment on its drivers. And I'm wondering whether this is a case of uh, certain types of jobs being replaced by others, where it's sort of a skills and retraining pro problem, or whether this is a case of just jobs relocating to city centers, right? And agglomerating in city centers. And why I think, I guess like that's interesting is because it connects to sort of the, the bigger question about what's like the optimal city size or whether it's better to have like one mega city or like a couple of them versus having like a bunch of smaller uh, cities. And I was wondering what's your take on that? Thank you. Um, yeah. Um... Well, in terms of the loss of these centers, basically um, someone actually the, in the policymaking uh, arena was uh, sleeping at the wheel. Um, uh, as I said, uh, this kind of balance um, between jobs and housing and skills and uh, the wider urban environment is very delicate. And uh, if you look throughout uh, urban history, you have uh, cities that uh, a canal is silted and therefore uh, chips no longer come, and therefore uh, the trade declined and people dispersed. And the, the most talented will jump ship first. And uh, if you look at Belgian cities, there are many of those uh, medieval cities uh, like that. And Venice was uh, 
affected by uh, a rate trade rule change, and therefore trade no longer would absolutely need to go through there. And uh, in in Britain, is really to do with um, in structural industrial change. And uh, for a good city, um, while a, a trade is flourishing, and then the general skills, um, either to do with technology or management, uh, should be used to develop the new trade. And this could happen naturally if you maintain really good transport links to other uh, productive centers. And uh, one of the reasons in Britain was that uh, transport uh, became uh, less um, uh, good comparatively to other places. And therefore, uh, learned in the South Seas to maintain the very good links actually with Europe, and therefore it uh, survived and actually flourished, and uh, the rest uh, declined. And once decline set in, then the dynamics will make sure that so you don't really know which one is the main cause, because uh, one thing will lead to another, and therefore uh, decline leads to more declines and success leads to more successes. In terms of city sizes, uh, you can see both uh, bigger sizes uh, uh, being successful. Um, the Tokyo metropolitan region is uh, one good example of 30 million people being a successful region. And now the only growing region in the uh, in the whole country, which uh, actually suffers uh, well overall the population decline, but uh, in the Tokyo metropolitan area is still growing. So that's one model. And if, if you look at um, Germany, there are no cities more than a million um, and a bit. So actually, I think uh, strictly speaking, there's no city uh, over a million. And, uh, but also it has uh, a very curiously um, an area of uh, tremendous high tech growth away from the coast in the south and also a uh, much more challenging situation in the north uh, and the east. And uh, so it's harder to generalize in terms of city size. So I think city size could actually work both uh, as one big city region or actually interconnected to many very much smaller city regions. Mm -hmm. um, unless there are other questions from the room at the moment, um, I would maybe follow up with um, um, another, I think a, a bit of a design type of question uh, in, in these very complex and data hungry land use transportation interaction models like Louisa. Um, which is that uh, oftentimes planners and urban designers don't really or are not so used to working at the regional or national level with massive infrastructure plans as scenarios. Like, so let's design a high speed rail network of this sort or uh, a, a flight network of this sort and the sort of huge multi decade national planning uh, efforts. Though there, of course, is this whole history of regional planning that has done uh, that to some extent at the regional scale. But how? But, but nevertheless, um, I, in these types of models, uh, intra-city connectivity is key as well. And I think perhaps yes. exemplified by the fact that London is, amongst many other factors, so attractive for workforce because of its exceptional intra-city connectivity that within the several zones around London, you are exceptionally well interconnected with folks from different industries uh, and, and places of interest. Now that gets closer to the world of urban design in a sense that if we think about improving intra-city connections, whether they're in Manchester or Leeds or, or London, uh, then developing scenarios that can change behavior of how people would, would move uh, and, and uh, connect within cities is very much, I think, uh, in the realm of urban design. Uh, whether it be uh, investments into a, a new bicycle highway, if we anticipate a, an enormous increase in, in demand for bicycling, or whether we talk about uh, uh, slow streets or shared streets that encourage more face-to-face uh, -face interaction rather than vehicular, or, or, or a new subway corridor, etc. Can you uh, talk a little bit about how urban designers may or urban design scenarios may be tested in Luisa type of models 
uh, to, to examine the effects of these different intra-CD interventions that urban designers can, could very well help craft and, and envision. Yes, and uh, um, Luisa has the, the transport module to, uh, uh, to uh, well, which is incorporated in, in the um, spatial equilibrium model, um, which uh, then uh, represents different uh, schemes and uh, from walking to cycling to buses um, to cars and to uh, urban rail and metro all of these uh, are included um, in the next few years because of the uh, challenges uh, both in funding very large projects and also in uh, the long uh, duration and the cost um, high cost of uh, constructing uh, inter-urban projects. Um, urban designers uh, will probably uh, have more, uh, I think you're absolutely right, uh, opportunities to work uh, on intra-urban, uh, small-scale um, neighborhood projects, uh, which are uh, hugely important um, in their own right. Um, however, uh, what um, I, I would caution um, urban designers uh, on the whole is that uh, it is important to know that, that there's a huge continuum and uh, however big the city it is, um, only intra-urban uh, travel is not going to be enough uh, at all, simply because uh, intra-urban um, could only reach out to so many people, right? So, and uh, there are a lot more interesting people in other places, and uh, particularly uh, for areas, with, uh, for cities, for example, in Northern England, or in Scotland, or Belfast, uh, well, in Northern Ireland, and Wales, and places like that. Unless uh, you make it possible for people to connect uh, to the current uh, growth areas in London and in the wider southeast in general, and those places will not benefit. So uh, unless they benefit from this, uh, what will happen is that uh, the families will think uh, if you have a, a bright child, you will actually just get them to go to London the southeast. And this actually has been the, the dynamics um, in the last um, uh, two or three decades. So um, absolutely uh, important to improve intra-urban, but uh, only intra-urban would not be enough. Great. Thanks, Pro Professor Ying. We have a couple of questions in the chat related yes. to environmental con considerations. So wondering yes. whether you've also incorporated that in, in your models. Yes, that's right. And uh, also, uh, these are recursive. And uh, so basically, um, uh, over time, uh, more and more stringent um, environmental concerns can be incorporated into that. And uh, so, and also, um, when I say that uh, I want uh, the transport to go fast rather than just go walking, um, I certainly am aware of these challenges. However, um, what uh, is happening in technology is that um, you can now actually power these uh, um, uh, faster transport um, with uh, sustainable energy. Um, that there are many different options uh, here, and I think you covered some of these uh, in your early uh, talks, and uh, which is uh, important. And uh, basically, uh, unless you enable people to reach out um, and uh, to get a wide attachment for ideas, uh, for funds, and so on, um, you will not have enough um, uh, money locally actually to address your environmental concerns uh, in this way. So this is going to be quite a, a hard battle. And within that, of course, uh, everyone should uh, play um, their own role to be environmentally uh, responsible. So for example, I uh, drive uh, 
relatively little uh, of car. So each time I, I do something, I look at the benefit and cost and make sure that uh, the, uh, the benefit, including the uh, environmental benefit, um, will far outweigh the costs. Thank you. Maybe in the last couple of minutes, because we're running out of time, I was wondering whether yeah. you could comment on uh, the transportation interconnectivity point that you were talking about. Specifically, there's one question about the HS2, which is the high-speed yes. train, um, mm -hmm. and how you see that sort of affecting uh, the, the growth um, of the economy in the long term. Yes, it's a long term. And uh, the uh, HS2 has got uh, this uh, dilemma, which I think um, in most OECD countries, people have got um, basically the biggest push of an infrastructure building uh, in a kind of a chaotic situation like Victorian Britain uh, that has long passed. Uh, therefore, uh, although uh, people would see some long term benefits um, in the next one or two decades in the building process and the uh, the HS2 may actually take two decades to, to build out. Um, there are nothing but uh, costs, costs to the environment and costs to the tranquility of the house goods uh, nearby, uh, near the line, and so on. And uh, those are situations that um, uh, which actually made the projects uh, very expensive, right? So um, HS2, uh, so long as the uh, this can be coordinated with uh, very substantial land use developments um, that actually will benefit from a, a, a new rail spine between London and uh, the, the northern cities from, uh, to midland cities like Birmingham and the northern cities like Manchester and Leeds and so on. Um, it will not be worth it. So actually, uh, urban designers need to play a huge role because uh, the benefit actually comes from mainly from a uh, new and a more intelligent way of uh, developing cities to benefit from it. And further on from that, um, what I would say is that uh, the business and, and socially uh, critical transport uh, can still be actually taken uh, by flights uh, for longer distances where rail cannot really compete very well. And, and those um, the flights uh, need not to be uh, environmentally uh, damaging as currently, because um, I think uh, new um, technologies to test the new engines, uh, electrically powered engines, for example, uh, are being developed. So. Over that time scale, I will be optimistic that something will come along. Great. Um, thank you so much. We are um, officially out of time. Uh, we will uh, share the chat uh, with you. Uh, and I want to thank you. Appreciate your call to engage urban designers at a much larger regional um, level of systems of cities, even national levels, to to influence where, where urban growth is really going. And I think that that's that call is apt, uh, not only in the UK, but very much also in the US and, and other countries who all have um, similar worries. Um, I just want to also conclude uh, with the um, announcement for the next talk. So next uh, Monday, uh, we will be joined by Bruno Moser, who is a partner at uh, Foster and Partners, uh, yeah. also out of London. Um, mm -hmm. and. Um, Please join us back um, uh, if um, you're interested in, in continuing this conversation about urban design and, and actual urban design projects that um, they've been uh, working on around the world. Uh, so please join me in thanking uh, Professor Jin. Uh, really um, enjoyed your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I look forward to see uh, what the comments that the um, uh, people have made, or yeah. actually they may be so shocked that they will not if, make if comments. Uh, if you're available, please, we can stay on the line for a few minutes or, or break out into different rooms. I'll, I'll, yeah, uh, well, so uh, I, I follow you uh, on that one. And um, But uh, what I will say is that uh, uh, for urban design, it's good to go big. Um, so, well, your neighborhood projects will make an impact, but uh, um, given that uh, you are in one of the uh, best universities in the world, you should actually 
try to make that impact uh, uh, benefit um, a much larger group of people. Great, thank you so much. Um, I will set up a quick uh, 